Hello and welcome to the Audio Time Capsule. I'm your host, comedian Simon Kane, and for those of you new to the show, which I guess is all of you, considering this is episode one, it's a bit redundant, this is the podcast where I get a guest to come on and leave 15 to 20 questions, and then a year later they come back on and answer them. I then use editing tricks to make it sound like they are talking to their past self. All past voices will sound like this, and all present voices will sound like this. So to give you an example, here is a question I recorded before the first guest arrived. Hey Simon, uh, of the future, have you found your keys? It's only the back and front door ones you've lost, but if I'm honest, it is making your life immeasurably unlivable (laughs) because you have to work around everyone else's schedule to let you in. You found them? Did you resolve it? Resolve it? Like, how formal? (laughs) Like, um, yes, you found your keys, you found them in your sister's bag. It was weird because you don't use your sister's bag for anything and she didn't claim that she borrowed your keys. Actually, your passport was in there as well. So it appears that somebody was trying to steal your identity by taking your front and back door key and your passport and your sister's bag and then running away. I, I, I can't explain it. I literally don't have a clue because I don't use the bag. She claims she didn't borrow any of that. And why would she borrow your passport? It's so weird. Yeah, so you found your keys. You found about a week later, but I remember that week. That week was fucking agony. A little bit of background. The idea of this podcast hit me three years ago. I had just started podcasting, and I wanted to do something that was a little bit different to anything I could find that was out there. Unfortunately, at the time, I was focused on my debut solo stand-up show and couldn't find the time to invest in this project, my other podcast, the show, and life, friends, all that other kind of stuff. So I put the project to one side and would intermittently research and look into it to work on the structure and the format and all the other things that go into a project like this. In June 2016, so just over a year ago, my good friend and very funny comedian, Beck Hill, said, did you ever do that podcast? Because I really like the idea of that. And I said, I didn't. And she said, do you think you're ever going to do it? And I said, yeah, I probably should get on that. <laughs> I, probably, I, pro- I probably should start making that if I'm ever going to do it, because otherwise I've got to shelf it. You can't wait more than three years to start a project if, if you're not going to bother with it. There and then I committed to starting recording the questions. And in August 2016, I got a room in the Sweets venue in the Grass Market Hotel with JD Henshaw who is the owner of that venue and he allowed me to record the questions can't thank him enough for being so supportive and I got all the people that I found interesting at the time to come on and leave their questions then a year later I planned on recording their answers unfortunately life doesn't always go to plan sometimes that's a good thing sometimes that's a bad thing as you'll find out in each of the episodes of this podcast but but this one happened to be a good one in July 2017 so about three months ago I got an email from Julia McKenzie who is the current head of radio at the BBC she'd heard about this project I was working on and wanted to talk about it in more detail. I went in for a meeting the week before I went up to do the Edinburgh Fringe with my second debut hour this year and she was like can we keep talking about it see where it goes see what happens with it and I was like yeah that's great because I wouldn't mind putting it on the BBC that'd be a bit of fun. Unfortunately that fell through. I got a message from them recently telling me that their 2017-2018 schedule is full. My fingers are crossed for a 2018-2019 schedule but right now that is up in the air so at this point I need to bank that and put that to one side. The reason I tell you that story is partly to show you that there has been some pretty big interest in this project before I've even launched it, and partly so that you're aware that the guest that's come on first was told before they started recording their answers that this might go out on national radio. When he came on, it was a podcast. When he recorded the answers, he thought it might be on a national radio show. He acknowledges this in some of the answers, and I just wanted to make it clear that that is the reason why that is in this podcast, because otherwise the context wouldn't have made any sense to you. This episode is with my friend and comedian Adam Bloom. He's been performing since 1993 and has done numerous TV appearances on things like Russell Howard's Good News and Mock the Week. Now the podcast is ostensibly about time travel, but in reality it is a chance for the guests to ask themselves anything they wish an interviewer would. As a result, the questions can vary from personal life to mental health to random thoughts in their head to everything in between. If you like what you hear, please do hit the subscribe button and share it with your friends. Any and all help is massively appreciated. But for now, let's listen to the audio time capture of Adam Bloom. Hi, my name is Adam Bloom. Today's date is 8th of October 2016. I am currently sat in a strange pub that's funded by the comedy world. I am feeling excited about this project because I think it's quite innovative. Hello, my name is Adam Bloom. I'm a stand-up comedian and writer, uh, which is rather pretentious way of saying stand-up comedian. It's the 22nd of October 2017 i'm about to open a time capsule and listen to some questions i asked myself a year ago this week um and i'm quite excited because i can't remember what i asked myself how's the last year of comedy been for you 
What have you done? What have you achieved? What have you enjoyed? What have you not enjoyed? The most exciting thing I've done in the last year was I did a second tour of Japan, just small venues, but four or five cities. But the exciting thing was that I knew in Osaka there were going to be a lot of people coming back to see me. So I had to do a new 45. And the thing is, I did an extra show in Osaka and had to do a different 45 for the because I knew it would be the same people coming back, largely. So I couldn't even jump jump back on my second favorite 45 minutes so I had to come up with a new 45 which meant I was writing the way you work towards Edinburgh but just to do ultimately two gigs in a 60-seater venue for Fukuoka and Tokyo were different because I knew there'd be new people I think one person in Fukuoka came up to until I saw you last time so you know Osaka's a little city it's got a, quite a nice comedy culture going on so you know people work really hard towards edinburgh so they can impress the industry for a month but i was working hard towards two shows in a 60 seat venue i think there's something quite charming about that and i got got i got it done by the deadline i got, slipped a bit of uh, very old material in that, that would have looked new to them but predominantly i did a new 45 minutes and it felt great you've been doing comedy for nearly 24 years now what is the most important thing you'd say you've learned in that time about comedy the most important thing I've learned is that persona leads the material far more than material leads the persona. And the analogy I use for it is that your persona is a tree and the leaves are your jokes. And if you have leaves and no tree, they just fall on the floor. But if you have a tree with leaves that stuck to them, it's it. You have a beautiful thing. And that is my advice to new comedians. Now, the other thing I've learned is that my persona is changing as I change and evolve as a person and grow up just there's a silliness I managed to have on stage when I'm enjoying myself and when I'm in that zone which I was last night in Nottingham I can't fail to be funny because I I am my joie de vivre is such that the the funny thing that in me that makes me unique is on the surface and that means when I'm doing the material I'm selling it with a funny vibe and when I'm between the jokes I'm either improvising or or just looking funny because I can't wait to be funny. I, Pippa Evans, a friend of mine, comedian, as you, who you all obviously know, of, she said that she worked with um, oh my god, what's his name? He's a he died recently. He's got big, thick, bushy eyebrows. He's a thespian. He's a real actor, director, stage guy. Anyway, this guy, I wish I could remember his name, but he said to her, the best thing a, a comic actor can do or comedian can do is look like they're about to be funny. And I thought, that, I've never thought about it like that. But that anticipation in your eyes of a, you're going to do something funny, you're going to say something funny, that means you're being funny before you've been funny. So the moment of being funny because you're about to be funny means that nothing's actually happening but the audience are excited to see what you're about to say. And you've already won then, haven't you? The anticipation of what's coming up next. I don't mean a punchline. Oh, where's, it, what's this going? where's this going? The actual moment of watching someone going they're about to be funny and that's exciting so I, I know I've gone all over the, the world answering this question but you know if you don't have a persona you don't you're not a comedian and there are a lot of people get frustrated they think that was a great joke why didn't it work because you weren't funny and and um the 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 that this I just feel it sometimes on stage where I I cannot fail to be funny because I'm excited about being up there and that joy that joy in me is actually shining through my eyes and that makes me funny and I don't you know, if I'm doing a gig where I'm just going for the motions, I get the laughs, but there's no magic in the air. So, you know, your persona, knowing exactly why you're funny. And that changes. That's the interesting thing. That changes in time. The silliness in me now is, was not there in 1996, and I had a great Edinburgh show, did an hour, and it's not the same. It just is not the same. So you're evolving. Be aware of yourself. Know who you are as you change. And enjoy each stage because each stage is actually slightly different, like a rainbow gradually changing colour. But over 20 years, you can see you've gone from yellow to, what's the opposite yellow on the rainbow? What, red to blue. Is it red to blue? Purple. What are the two opposite colours of a rainbow? Blue, red and blue. You've written three sitcom pilots, um, one that's been looked at in detail by somebody in, in power, and the other two just sort of just stayed at home with you. Why haven't you worked on the fourth one? Or if you have, what is it? I haven't worked on a fourth one. I think I lost confidence with sitcom writing after my third attempt. Saying that, my first two attempts were never seen by anybody. But my, so my first attempt was probably the best. And it ended up not being seen because I got a Radio 4 series commissioned the year I wrote it. So I put it aside to think about Radio 4. 
Um, so maybe I should look back at that. That'd be a good idea, wouldn't it? Uh, 15 years later. However, um, the third one I wrote didn't get made. It went through five drafts. Didn't get any money for it to make a pilot or work on it. And I think I lost confidence because I know in 24 years how much I know about comedy. So I know in two years of writing sitcoms, as in collective time doing it, how little I probably know. So I'm an open spot in the sitcom world. And being an open spot as a stand-up, I, I had no idea how much there was to learn. I thought you went on stage, you were either funny or you weren't funny. I saw a comedian have a bad gig or I'd seen him have a good gig once. thought, the audience don't realise he's good. Well, he's not good tonight, and that's the difference. And I know so much about stand-up that when I look at what I know about sitcom, it terrifies me. So my, yeah, my knowledge of one thing has actually stifled my desire to learn about another. Which is a shame, really, because I should go, let's learn about that. But, as you know, I'm 46, nearly 47. Maybe I feel that the thing I do best, I've got so much experience that I should continue to work on that. But, uh, yeah, it's a little bit defeatist, isn't it? But I just wonder how long it takes to be a good sitcom writer. And will I ever become one? It's a different skill. Which of the comedians that you've enjoyed in 2016 do you think now would have gone on to be more successful as a result of their ability? Oh, that's a good question, Adam. Um, I don't know. Can I ask you a question? Who's come through in the last couple of years commercially? Oh, Spencer Spencer Jones. Um, I saw Spencer Jones doing The Herbert about nine months ago, and I was howling. It was so inventive. It was so silly. That laughing at his own jokes at the end of each one, it was so infectious. Um, and I, I, was, I was blown away. And I hear he's had some uh, Edinburgh success. And I heard he's had some TV stuff um, coming his way. So that's the guy that I went, wow, last year. And he's the guy that seems to have done of the wows I had. I can't remember the other wows, actually. That Comedy is a, a little bit bland for me at the moment because I think it's been saturated by people who are in it for the wrong reason. And when I started doing, you know, you didn't have stadium feeling comedians and you didn't have... You know, there weren't there were only five, six famous comedians at the time, so the chance of being one of those six was very slim. So your goal was to become a comedian and make a living out of it. And now people's goals seem to be to have their global domination and and at least have their own TV show or be able to fill a stadium one day. You know, that seems to be you know my least favorite phrase in comedy is make it. He's made it. What? Where's the line? Jerry Seinfeld earns sixty million a year apparently, and Chris Rock earns twenty earns twenty million a year dollars. Does that mean Chris Rock hasn't made it until he earns sixty one million or sixty million? Don't know where it works. Do you make it when you equal someone? Do you make it when you beat them? Where's the line? And to me, making it is 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 making a living doing the thing you love. T- to someone else, making it could be being able to get up there in the first place. You know, wh- where's the line? You you create your own line. Um, and I think successful people are never happy because they keep moving the line. You know, I want to be able to fill a 2,000-seater theatre. Or he's doing a stadium, why can't I do a stadium? Well, I'll have a go at doing a stadium, I didn't fill it up. I supported Jim Jeffries in Tel Aviv last June, which was a phenomenal experience. We're at a basketball stadium doing two nights. Now, this is not a humble boast. And when I say that, I'm not just talking about the fact that I supported him. This is an important point I want to make. He sold out a 3,700-seater basketball stadium in two and a half hours in a country he'd never set foot in. So they put on a second show and he sold over about 3,400 of the 3,700. So this, he, you know, he sold over 7,000 tickets in two days. The first night I went out there, it was so much fun. He goes out there, he's phenomenal. The second night, I'm about to go on stage and Jim sticks his head round into the basketball stadium that's grossing about probably 100,000 pounds, maybe more. And he sticks his head round and he goes to me, mm. Still quite a few empty seats. And I went, Jim, this is an extra show because you sold out 3,700 tickets. You sold out about 3,500 now. Can you step back and at least see how well you're doing? And he and he, yeah, he burst out laughing because it was a moment of just showing him exactly where he is and exactly how he's failing to see it. And um, I just find that fascinating that you can you can lose sight, but it all becomes relative, doesn't it? So um, I can't even remember the question. <laughs> what was my question? Oh, uh, people who are doing well and who I predicted. Yeah, um, so Spencer Spencer Jones, I'm very pleased for you if you're listening to this. He did a very sweet thing, actually. I did I did my first gig with him, but apparently I'd gig with him when he was an open spot, 
doing straight stand-up. And at the end of his gig, Ben he's got this persona that really is being silly and, and wacky. And at the end of his gig, he said, listen, you've got a, a great guy next. Um, I, he came up to me after my first gig and said, welcome to a wonderful world. And, w- it, you know, it's what's nice is it's... it's I, I don't remember saying that, but it's obviously a very open-armed thing to say to somebody. And also I realised he was going to do well, or at least make a living, because you can't get into the world unless you're going to gig enough. But to gig enough, you've got to at least be good enough to get an open spot, hopefully get paid. But, you know, if you're awful, you're not going to get, you're eventually not going to get any work at all, right? Paid or unpaid, I mean. But the point is that it wasn't just that I, my point isn't that, I, it was just nice to know that one, I'd said that, and two, that someone could remember it 10 years later and tell an audience that. It's almost the best introduction I've ever had. And it happened before the interval that I was on after. So I thought it was a very nice thing to say to somebody. Um, you know, there's some people who were very... Nick Wilty was extremely nice to me when I started. And some comedians didn't have a, any time for me. And you walk in the dressing room terrified and they ignore you. You know, you do an open spot at the comedy store, you're absolutely terrified. And for comedians to just ignore you and just give you a little nod and compl- have no empathy for you. We all know what it's like. It's like when learner driving instructors cars have um driving teachers cars have you were a learner once written on the back you know you, you know if you start overtaking learners or beeping them it's like you just remember what it felt like to be new so you know people like nick wilty were so good to me and um I, I always make a point of trying to be very supportive and ask someone how long they've been going to give them some advice you know about you know the, the comedy stores a, a, amazing woman the audience are excited to be there so you can you can ride on that but the confidence they've got rather than be intimidated by it use it to your advantage but um yeah it's very important to to remember what it felt like to be new assume you're alive now are you pleased to be alive yeah i'm glad to be alive it, life is definitely a gift i remember thinking of an idea when i was like 24 that people say life's a gift if that's the case then a birth certificate must be a receipt and committing suicide is equivalent of taking something back to the shop and asking for a refund and i thought at the time it was really like controversial idea i know and i haven't even said this on stage i've never ever said that before didn't even try it out once but the point is this is the thing about i was saying about evol- evolving my opinion doesn't match that now because at 46 i appreciate life as a gift and i at 24 I was probably trying to be edgy and go yeah who you know it's like teenagers go yeah I want to die oh, I've had enough I don't like my life I hate my mum I hate my dad I, I um, you know life is an incredible gift and even if you're not enjoying it there will be moments where you are enjoying it and Beastie Boys to quote MCA God rest his soul life comes in phases take the good with the bad and and um you know that as simple as it is was good advice because when I'm going through a low I get some proper lows like like the stereotype of comedians I am that stereotype unfortunately but that that um those extreme lows you've got to sit them through haven't you so I'm glad to be alive although sometimes I have admittedly not been there was a time you did an Edinburgh show four years running solo show and then you went one year off one year on two years off one year on two years off one year on and now you've managed to do uh nine years off in 2016 so you thought that was ridiculous and it's timed in 2017 you do an Edinburgh show did you do it and how was it on the back of this uh writing burst for japan i decided in february or march i'm going to do edinburgh because i'm going to have so much new material and then contacted a friend and all the slots available both slots available were either 10 30 in the morning or midnight and i thought i'm just not prepared to play you know midnight you get the drunks in uh, especially some of the locals and and um uh 10 30 in the morning it just doesn't feel a time for what i do you know it's i i, I it's quite intense. It's I don't want people just waking up, getting out of bed, and seeing me. I don't think I'm that kind of comic. I don't think many people are. But if there are comedians who suit that, I'm not one of them. So I didn't go. And I wonder if that was a cop out. But the truth is, if I'm going to make a comeback after ten years, I don't want to be performing early in the morning, or late at night. Your whole day would be free. That would be pretty cool. But I think Daniel Kitson did that once in the theatre. I suppose you're almost on holiday, aren't you, for a month? But nonetheless, I decided not to. So the question is, will I go next year? And um. You know, it's, it's something very humbling about, you know, I I was, by 1999, I could, I was in a 350-seater selling, Monday night would be 200 seats, and weekends would be full, and then between would be somewhere between those two numbers. And, you know, we're talking about, oh my God, 19 years later now, being in a room a quarter the size. A lot of my fans then have either retired or become parents and not had the freedom to go, 
and there are new people who don't know who I am and I think that's quite humbling at the same time it's a challenge to get back on the horse but you know I'd have to put my ego aside to do that because there'll be TV producers who haven't heard of me because they're in their 20s and they don't only learn about comedy from going to Edinburgh isn't it funny there are people who live in London there are comedians who live in London TV producers live in London and yet the only time these producers see the comedians who are performing round the corner from there where they live and work 51 weeks a year sorry 48 weeks a year all go up to Edinburgh and they might see them within that four week period even probably the, just a bank holiday weekend I remember Ed Byrne did a run at the Hammersmith some theatre in Hammersmith did a really good run a big nice like 600 seater and his agent took me aside and she said look I know this seems weird but you know Edinburgh's just so saturated with comedians and it's what it's people in London go up to see people from London she thought well, I want to do a run here they can come and see him here I thought it was just a quite nice bit of original thinking to go well, don't, we're not going to do the festival we're going to do our own run you've written for a lot of people one of the people you've written for is very high profile that you don't talk about uh, has that relationship uh, got better closer and are you doing anything significant with that person if so what is it even though you're not allowed to talk about it <laughs> that's a bad question <laughs> I just made myself laugh um, I haven't worked with that person since it's been two years and that's the longest gap I've had but the last project they did didn't really need my work because it wasn't about words so no I haven't the thing I did with them two years ago I had a heavy involvement with and um, it's very exciting it's extremely exciting because they get in touch with me and then go right this is what I want to do we've got ideas on this and I go bang, 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 bang. and then they come back to me and they say well use this 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 and this and I get paid a daily fee it doesn't matter what they use or don't use but of course I would far rather have my work used and not used because it's not about the money it's about being involved artistically with somebody extremely successful and extremely respected there's a little part of me that feels a bit hard not hard done by but i for example i've had something i wrote quoted in time magazine and i'll never get credit for that ever in my life but at the same time it's a bit like being what's his name um what's his name with the big nose bergerac that's right being the poet who writes the love poem for somebody else yeah so that's great the 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 two-year gap of not doing anything has I, I do think so come on come on you know i want to hear any i'll get an email from you saying next project but hopefully that will come and when it comes if it comes i'll be back doing that exciting thing but it's very yeah it's very exciting knowing that millions of people will will read your ideas and you know not being credited isn't actually that important what's important is that it's there that it exists which is actually a very interesting thing about comedians feeling the need to perform if you didn't perform ever again but your work was being appreciated would that keep you going or do you need the instant hit of the adrenaline of being on stage i'm, I'm so addicted to that feeling it doesn't get any less intense just wonder you know reaching a stage of maturity where you only need to be creative Maybe there's a newer stage of maturity where you only need to think creative things and no one has to hear them. Do a gig to yourself in the mirror, in a field. You had a revelation the other day to change your daily lifestyle in the sense of picking up the flute again that you used to play as a child, and, and which I could still just about play, and getting into that, working permanently on either new stand-up or a project. The close-up magic is something I always do, but the idea was, you you know, you hear about people saying, I'm into horse riding, I'm into this, and there's suddenly loads of things you don't do. I don't cook, I don't read, I don't swim, I don't jog. So the idea was actually overnight, go, I'm going to do all of these things. Have you done those things and how does it feel? I really think the idea of reading, having not read in your life really, pretty much, and playing an instrument that you haven't done since you're 11, doing those all in the same day, it, your brain could just expand at an alarming rate. I mean, imagine, so that would involve drinking less, not not at all, but drinking far less. Uh, how do you get on with those things? And if you didn't get around to doing them, why? Um, I got around to doing one thing, which is not on the list. No, actually, that's not true. I got around to writing every day for the first three months of this year, pretty much every day. And I've started working out in a gym intensely, two hours three times a week and i'm which involves treadmill as well i got in shape very quickly and hopefully that will keep keep happening keep, you know I, I won't let that go the writing thing happened for you know a third of the year but the flute thing hasn't no um but it is a reminder that i can do it and i just i am disappointed in myself because the, the idea was but bearing in mind I forgot that question existed <laughs> I shouldn't beat myself up too much about forgetting to do something I don't remember saying but at the time you know it's that procrastination thing and do you know what I'm going to do I'm going to pick my flute up it's actually I don't have it in my house at the moment but I know where it is I can pick my flute up and start again I think I don't care enough about playing the flute to do it what I care enough about is changing my lifestyle 
in a very positive when i go to the gym the ritual of getting everything ready for the gym is quite quite a lot of things to check off on my list and that process of going there, it's such a positive feeling when i get there and i go right i've got this is ahead of me it's hard work when i get near the end of it i go okay I'm nearly finished and then i get to the last set of the last exercise and i go i've done it and i have a shower get dressed and i feel great now i think that feeling if you then go back and play the flute then you read i've only read one novel in my adult life which was the curious incident of the dog in the night time that's the only book i've read since leaving school at 16 oh my god 30 years one book so if i were to go to the gym come back play the flute then pick up a book then write some stand-up because i don't really write my stand-up you see only deadlines cause me to write it i live a kind of bohemian lifestyle when i just look out the window of a cafe and an idea hits me when i wasn't expecting one that's how i write or on stage when you know i'm improvising so yeah this is a if if anyone gets anything out of this podcast it will be me realizing i should then go and pick up the flute especially as now in a positive frame of mind with drinking less and training yeah what could you bring i remember arj barker i was in sydney with arj barker in 1999 and he was talking about exercising whilst being creative in the same day and he said when there's an incredible thing where your body and mind together are both feeling great i mean i suppose i had that yesterday because i went to the gym then did two gigs so that's within the same day but i quite like the idea of immediately after the gym doing something creative Um, i'm a bit thick after i've been to the gym because the blood seems to leave my brain i don't know how that works any logic to that all i know is i make really simple errors when i've just been to the gym so maybe I should give it a half an hour before I pick up. Imagine finding out you can't read when you've just been to the gym. So signs at the gym have to be really big so people on the way out could actually go, oh, out. But anyway, so yeah, thanks for that. Thanks, Adam, a year ago for reminding me I'm no more motivated now than I was then. You moved out from your house in August 2015. It is now over two years later. Have you moved on? What's your relationship with your ex-wife or wife? And and uh, have you got your own place? And how are you coping with life without living with your children? What's the relationship with them going like? And um, are you happier? This is the question I remember asking and the one I've been dreading answering, if I'm honest with you. Um, I have been renting and house-sitting for t- two years. Uh, my divorce is still in process, but that's partly my fault for slowing the process down. But um, no, I've only just decided a week ago to start renting properly with deposits and all that stuff so for two years and two months i've got away with house sitting and moving around and renting here and there so no i haven't Uh, my relationship with mike's is much better she asks how i am which is a nice feeling my advice to anyone who's going through a divorce is any argument you instigate is only going to make things worse nothing's going to be achieved by having a go at someone sending an angry text having a row standing at the front door arguing or whatever you know any phone call voice message is at the time it seems like the right thing to do to to let them know how you feel because of a sense of injustice but the right the right thing to do is let everything go because that's the only way you're going to move forward and get a better relationship and just be completely let everything wash over you if you're treated badly not that i was just deal with it and let it cope cope and your children if you have children are the most important factor so therefore your job is to provide for them and make them feel loved and not feel like their parents don't like each other so and eventually they will like each other and if they don't, then you still have a responsibility to not act like you don't like each other because no one benefits from that. Absolutely no one benefits from it. That's easier said than done, though. When someone's upset you when you want to send a text message or leave a voicemail explaining how you're, you've been left feeling or, you know, put out. But, you know, it, it's... So it, it took me being nicer for her to be nicer. Therefore, the quicker you're nicer, the quicker they'll be nicer to you. Simple as that. That wasn't easy to answer. Have you got laid yet? If so, how did you get on? <laughs> oh my god when i asked that question this was a podcast now i'm answering it as a potential bbc radio 4 series did you get it yet and if so how did you get on yes and absolutely appallingly at first i can't believe i'm answering this <laughs> put it this way if something that normally takes between 10 minutes and 40 minutes hasn't been done for a long time or with a new person for a very very long time it might take more like 30 seconds <laughs> should we leave it there <laughs> but that was that was a, that was a year ago i think i'm up to about a minute and a half now you took a turn 
in 2016, late 2016, talking about slightly darker thoughts and slightly more negative experiences, but still trying to make them sort of positive, eat despite one bit about suicide that's very dark. Have you embraced that area and challenged yourself and been able to be funny about those things within your persona? I've got some stuff about divorce that I'm really proud of because it, it's, it's dark thoughts and it has audiences roaring with laughter and when i hit properly that it's as big as laugh as you can get on stage or as i can get on stage so yeah to make something to make a negative thought um actually i've just realized that is about suicide so i'm I'm, i must have had that um thought a a year ago i yeah that i didn't uh, that bit's a year old i thought it was less than a year old but obviously it's not because that's the no that's another bit i've got two suicide bits and the one of them is newer and the newer one's a stronger one. The one I talked about here goes very dark, and the audiences struggle to laugh at it because it's so dark. Coming from me as well, it just goes into a whole new. It's a bit like your grandmother punching you in the face. You just it's, you you never would expect it to happen, and when it happens, it t- takes a while to get over it. So that that one was a bit too dark, but I I actually had a joke I put on the end of it to deal with the tension. Here's an interesting thing. When you have tension at the end of a joke that doesn't get the big the big laugh, so the the room's still hanging, thinking about what you've just said, the natural instinct is to do a quick bit uh, to get the laugh out. But what I found was I did an even darker joke or an equally dark joke with a long setup to tag on the end of it. So I basically put two tunnels together and made the audience go through a longer journey and come out the end. And there was an explosive laugh at the end because I was making them hold their breath for far longer than is natural. And then when it got to the ending, which was a funny bit rather than a dark bit it let all the energy of the last two premises so basically you've gone from suicide to running away from home with the mum as a kid that that those two things back to back created a, a, an amazing amount of tension so basically i learned with all that experience i've got that actually if you've got tension on the back of a joke getting rid of that tension with a quick one isn't necessarily the best thing to do it's create another joke with tension at the beginning so the other one had tension at the end this one tension at the beginning so you're just putting an extension on a tunnel and um, that was a very interesting experience. And the laugh at the end was immense, but I had to really, really keep committing so the audience didn't have time to breathe. I had to just keep them keep them gripped. And then that was, yeah, very interesting. Putting a joke on the back of a joke doesn't work. To make both jokes work is a very interesting thing, I think, to do. This time last year, you've been on medication for quite a while. Are you still on it? If not, how does it feel to be off it? I am still on medication and... Uh, Again, this was a podcast where I asked myself this question, and now it's a national radio show. I feel like I've been slightly duped. Um, I have not been duped. It's just the this brilliant uh, premise for a podcast is a victim of its own success. I think. Uh, okay, here we go. I'm. I've. I was diagnosed a while ago as um, being uh, something called hypomanic, hypomanic, which is a low end bipolar, and. Um, hypo sounds like a lot but actually that's a misconception hyper is a lot and hypo means less than so hyper is more than less so manic is a real state of a a bipolar hyper manic is insanely out there i don't mean insanely as in mad i mean a high amount of insensitive choice of words there high amount and then a hypo manic is less than manic so i'm a lower end of manic but you know when i tell people that they go well, that's pretty obvious because of the way I am and the excitableness I have. Um, it's actually a creative condition. It actually means you have bursts of creativity when you are on a high. Unfortunately, those highs don't last forever and then you get low. And again, you know, the question earlier about, you know, wanting to be alive. I do want to be alive, but I do. My lows apparently are. Here's the thing. You don't know what it feels like to be anyone else. So you don't know what when they say I'm feeling low. You don't know what their low is. And who am I to say that I feel lower than other people do? All I know is somebody in whose job it is to diagnose how low you feel or or what you are made of has come to that conclusion but then again medication balances that out mood, mood stable i'm not an antidepressant i'm a mood stabilizer and they apparently keep you within a certain amount of not too up and not too down but i still get very excited and i still get down just hopefully not as down as, this is the thing i don't know it's that someone turning your volume down what's your you know your maximum noise you can make and then you're shouting you just feel like you're being loud as you can but actually there's you know it's gone from 10 to 8 but you don't know because you can't remember what 10 sounded like is your dad still alive in october 2016 uh, he was 84 and getting on a bit last year 
He seems to be the type that will be able to hang in there for a long time, just getting worse and worse with memory and stuff like that. He's still very sharp when he was sharp, but very kind of, you know, doddery when he was doddery and still giving signs of both sides of life, I suppose. Um, so, yeah, is he still alive? And if he's not, how does it feel? If he is, how does it feel? <laughs> My dad's still alive and he's going very strong. Um, his mind, if if he's sitting around the table, we're bantering, he's as sharp as anyone in a in a conversation. Obviously, you know, there'd be a moment you maybe repeat a question you've asked earlier or something. But hearing, I think hearing is a big thing. You know, you, you cross the room, someone says something and he doesn't hear it. And then people might get frustrated and say it louder, almost like, oh God, you're so annoying. There was a bank in Florida that had so many old customers that the staff had to put cotton wool in their ears and put smear Vaseline over glasses they had to wear. So they got an idea what it was like to not see properly and not hear properly. And you know, so sometimes I think old people, you know, it's like just because someone can't hear doesn't mean they don't understand. And it's almost like, oh, God, I have to explain this again to this person. So, you know, if anyone's listening who's got old relatives, just be aware that, you know, if you're in a nightclub and someone's talking to you, you have to ask them to repeat themselves. It's no different being old. It's just your hearing not working in comparison to other people's. Um, but, no, he's, he's razor sharp. And um, I think he's going to go to 100, actually. Your children will now be um, five and seven and a half what's that like what's your relationship with them like now and and what's it like to have them at that age because obviously seven and a half is quite a lot older than six and a half and certainly five and a half is a lot older than four and a half with regard to development so how does that feel and uh what's it like to to have children of that age um i'm not a fan of newborn babies i've always thought once you're a toddler you're you're more entertained to be around i think women have a you know maternal instinct to cuddle a newborn baby and feed it but once a child's over the age of one i find it very exciting maybe nine months so with that in mind i think after nine months old every age is as the best age because there's something else happening and i think you know some people say two is good because they start asking questions that why why but why but why that's amazing but you know having a conversation with a seven-year-old where you know they might sit cross-legged and ponder and actually look like they're absor- absorb- absorbing what you're saying in a different way and that a- awareness that's sort of being aware of you know more space around you so you can you can see what four people at the table are thinking or you can just rather than just staring at the person you're talking to that spatial awareness socially of, as you get older so um i don't like seven and a half and five any more than six and a half and four but i do love the growth and watching somebody just, i just love the idea of someone having an opinion and um and uh and and being able to articulate why they feel something and it's you know children you know children of religious people tend to be religious at least with when they're th- that age you know you don't get many devout atheists with religious parents at seven obviously your your opinions are largely affected by your parents but you know um my seven-year-old daughter's a pescatarian by choice and um and uh Oh, well, actually, but, but her mum's a, a vegetarian. <laughs> so, uh, but at least she eats fish. <laughs> at least she eats fish on her own accord. No, the, the, in a way, that's like the religious thing, actually. So, that's not, but but nonetheless, she still made a decision. To, oh, there we here we go. If you have religious parents, religion starts from the as soon as you can talk. But the the pescatarian thing is a decision at, at seven to go. I've decided I'm going to stop doing this now. But it's still influenced by your parents. But it's still a decision a change of lifestyle are you drinking less not that you had a drink problem before but you do like a drink are you drinking less or more i'm drinking far less and it's a lovely feeling and i i had this thing recently when i started going to the gym because that's three nights a week you can't drink because you can't turn up to drink the gym hungover what i've got is i think i've been in the last seven weeks i've been a bit drunk three times I, well, two of them two of them a bit drunk once i was drunk i regret all three of them because you know when you wake up feeling awful the next morning and you're not used to that you go that well that's a waste of a morning so i've really got into habit now of having two or three drinks i love two or three drinks one drink i can't deal with because you want another drink on one drink but i quite like the idea of having three drinks and going okay feeling a little bit tipsy it's a nice feeling and i'm going to have a glass of water go to bed early and feel great when i wake up and you know if i could live my 30s again i definitely would have drunk less because i've got so many you know you get old and you physically can't function well if you're in your late 20s early 30s and you're caning it because you're at festivals getting drunk every night you're waking up in melbourne rather than looking at the sun and going out and having a meal outside and enjoying the weather sitting in your room feeling awful trying to get the energy to get up and go and buy some food that you haven't got in your room 
and that's just a waste of time and you've got to add up the ups and downs of it or realize how you benefit from it most i do have a theory contradicting that though if you get drunk you have fun if you get hung over you don't have fun so that's a plus and a minus but the next day after the hangover you feel so good not being hung over that's two pluses and one minus so you're in a net gain profit of one good feeling however you could argue that the negative is two positives because it's so bad and therefore you even out again the yin and yang yin and yang people say yin and yang don't they like espresso it's yin and yang which i just got wrong and it's espresso and it's nothing not nothing p please please you really need to think about this have you been on McIntyre's Roadshow yet, given that there's been about six series of people who are predominantly not as good as you? You're only, only gripe with the industry. A lot of comedy comedians are quite bitter, I'm not. But I do think there are people that couldn't follow me in a club doing that show being very average, and it seems to be a little bit unfair, not a meritocracy. Have you had a sex change or race change to alleviate that problem? Do you feel guilty making that last comment? I have not been on the McIntyre's Roadshow, and I do... Um it's a weird one I've done seven series of the comedy store for the company that make McIntyre's Roadshow which is 14 episodes they made from those seven that's a lot of material and for, I suppose it's just I I think maybe I'm not big enough to be one of the big names and I'm not new enough to be one of the up and coming people so I fit in this horrible halfway between the two so I can see that but at the same time if you want a comedian to go on a TV show and do a good show to make the public laugh 95% of the public won't have heard of me because it's a mainstream program so to them i am up and coming so i don't see quite where i would not fit into that unless they're going we want to introduce brand new people to try and make stars even though if you've had a chance and you've and you, you failed in their eyes then you're dented goods and therefore it's like well, what if, what if i put that oh, it's like a dent, dented tin of baked beans in a shop you're not going to pick that one up you're going to pick the the, the, the fresh looking one so uh, yeah i can understand why i wouldn't be picked but at the same time you know they know what i can do and i you know, it, what's frustrating is when you're in a club with someone who is been on that show, but they would never put that person on last because they can't close a gig with people who are match fit in the middle. So they'll put them on last. Well, okay, there's not a meritocracy, that is it? It isn't. If you know, on a live circuit scene, you're being judged every twenty seconds by the audience as how funny you are. I mean, that's a constant assessment from your boss, isn't it? And th and therefore. The way the TV thing works isn't like that. It starts getting into who your agent is. It gets, starts getting into uh, um, demographics. You know, the, the female quota thing that gets a big subject in comedy is, you know, women think it's harder for them because audiences judge them, which they very much do. And men think it's harder for men because there are so many men to pick from for the job. The way I see it is on the club level, it's harder for women because of the prejudice they receive, even from women. And on the TV level, it's easier for them once they get past that club level. And this is what seems to happen. You've got women who are struggling to get by on the circuit because it's they're being judged by prejudiced audiences. But as soon as you get past that, which is a very hard hurdle to get past, harder for women, no doubt, doors open very quickly. So it's kind of a, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a yin and yang. And I, did I say yin or yang? There's a yin and yang. I think that, um, but back to the point, um, yeah, I, you know, if you're listening, uh, Open Mic Productions, I should be doing your show uh, because I'm very good and you know that. But yeah, I don't know how it works. Don't know, and Michael McIntyre likes me, so that's not that problem. In fact, I gave him a line that he used on his Royal Variety performance and we were driving along in... Uh, God, this is a bit, a bit boastful, isn't it? I should be on your show and here's a line I wrote for the best comedian in the country. Oh, no, I, it's very sweet, actually, what happened. I was driving back from a gig with McIntyre and he was about to drop me off at Stockwell Station to get a tube home and I suggested an uh, extra tagline on one of his routines and he laughed so much he gave me a lift home to my front door as a thank you, which is a very sweet thing to do. But then I saw it on the Royal Variety and thought, actually, you could have put me in a limo now. <laughs> but in all fairness, he didn't have a limo at the time and didn't know it was going to be used. But yeah, so it, open mic, if you're listening, if I've given Michael McIntyre a line that he used on his uh, Royal Variety performance that broke him and gave him ultimately that TV show, I'm 5% of his fame and therefore deserve 20% of your airtime. Are you seeing somebody seriously as opposed to just, you know, not really getting involved with anybody? Have you moved on in that area? Well, I've gone from 30 seconds to a minute and a half, and uh, let's leave it at that. How big is your willy now? How big was it then? Let's compare graphs. Um, <clears throat> of all the questions that I have asked myself, that I thought we were on a podcast and not a national radio show, I think that's the one I regret the most. It hasn't changed in size, 
although it has shrunk in the last 30 seconds. Have you written for anyone since last year who has a significant impact on the comedy world or the world? I No, I haven't, but I wrote for three people this Edinburgh, and what was exciting was they were such different forms of comedy and three forms of comedy I had not uh, turned my mind to, which is so rewarding. Um, I don't disclose who the people are, but one of them was musical, which meant I was writing lyrics that rhymed and had the cadence and whatever the syncopation or whatever the rule is to make words fit into lines. And that was a joy. I'm a massive hip hop fan. So it was like almost my two favorite things combined. And, you know, just because I'm a fan of hip hop doesn't mean I can write lyrics, but it turned out that the amount of time I spent listening to multiples, you know, when you run three syllables at the end of each line, it's gone into my brain and I can do it. And obviously I'm, I'm, I'm no Eminem, of course. But what was a joy was actually finding out that I could do comedy and rhyming and because I was never, never going to do that otherwise. Another one was an extremely dark show about very, very, very sad th- things in childhood, which was actually quite harrowing to read. Trying to write a joke when you've already just been harrowed is not nice. But but the uh, but the 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 thrill was actually going into the, those areas and and writing stuff. I know I talked about writing about suicide before, but this was spending three days writing loads and loads and loads of very very bleak jokes. Or at least punchlines to bleak topics. There's actually is a difference, isn't there? And the third one um, was something I can't describe because it would give away who it was because they're the only one that does that. But the but it wasn't so much the uh, there was no major success on the people I wrote for, but there was was a, a, a massive thrill of I think I've, I've written for about forty five people now, and the fact of the matter is they're nearly all stand ups. But every now and again you get a pickpocket or a sword swallower, you know, and and you're suddenly just turning your mind to that, or a, you know, a transsexual. And, you know, you're, it's just so exciting thinking from the perspective of someone whose life you will never have. That's, you know, really rewarding. I sat down with a friend the other day, and uh, she's a bloom modeler. Just a friend. We just met up for dinner. Haven't seen each other for years. And she was telling me an idea. My mind started racing with what we could do and what that. And can you put little pins under a little sort of clip and you're on, that goes into like a mouth guard and you're out, so you can pop a bloom with your mouth as, by leaning forward without the audience knowing why it's popped and what could you how what could be a result of the bloom popping and just she had a she's got a great imagination and it, it was just so exciting thinking about bloom modeling comedy ideas visuals you know logistical problems and uh yes yeah, so, so I, I i just absolutely adore turning my mind to something completely new and i don't just mean a comedian who's deadpan i mean a comedian who's got no arms or you know what I mean and suddenly you go right what's it like having no arms and how can I make that funny and um yeah it's, it's it's beautiful and it's just another reason why I absolutely love my job have you noticed the questions are getting slightly less significant and how does that make you feel listening to them now and realizing how uh little you had to say after 15 questions it's made me realize that I'm exactly as uninterested in answering them as you are in asking them wouldn't it be funny if I got more and more excited, the more bland the questions got? You know, this, what's it like a, a year, uh, two years after moving out, not living with your children? Yeah, that's right. And then going, <laughs> how big's your willy? Ah! Now let's talk about my willy for an hour. Any question can provoke any thoughts. So really, you know, it's, it's just a case of leaving me just talking to myself until something interesting happens. Or, you know, I don't you know. Any question can provoke anything. So it doesn't really matter. I, I Obviously, the cliche questions journalists are, are, ask you get a bit boring, especially if you do three interviews in a day. I remember Eminem uh, making a documentary and, he, and then he said, oh, I'm in England and the journalists, don't they realise I'm going to get the same questions? And he did this English and actually went, oh, what do you think of London? And what I loved was, it's just <laughs> asking somebody from from um, Detroit what they think of London. It's just he's just done sixteen interviews with the press. Ask him something different. I remember Danny Wallace when he was a journalist, a very young journalist. He interviewed interviewed Vic and Bob, and they must have done a few interviews that day. And okay, here we go again. You know, some program they were doing, and and he went right. We're going to play a game. And their eyes lit up, and he created this sort of board game that was answering questions. And the child in them came out. He told, I wasn't there for this, but thought, what an ingenious thing to do. Get these crazy, wacky comedians and bring them into the world they like being in rather than an interview format. And unfortunately, I didn't do that to myself. Is there anything you'd like to ask about the 20 questions that you felt were lacking in something you know what's funny is i just thought how meta to myself that so I, ex- I had exactly the same trade of thought which means i haven't evolved as a human being one iota in the last 12 months because i thought the same thing um i what would i ask myself now i tell you what i'd ask myself now what would i say to the people listening to this and thinking god you're a bit full of yourself if that's possible to think which i think it might be and my answer to that would be 
don't judge me i'm answering questions instantly that are being heard by millions of people certainly hundreds of thousands of people and you're one of them and i don't really have time it's not like i'm writing a, an email you know if i say something arrogant about you know being supporting jim jeffries or or being i can't i said something earlier oh that was it writing a joke for michael mcintyre you know i did and and you know there are humble ways of wording that but the point i'm really making was that i was not been asked to do a tv show that i feel qualified to do and that's the arrogant thing then you know i'm just being honest the 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 thing about writing for him that was just a train of thought that went who hosted oh that was it because he likes me and uh he likes what i do i know he likes what i do it just popped out of my head you know as i'm talking about the, why am i not because you know if he doesn't like you actively there's a good chance you won't do his show because he has enough power to go he's not going on the show you know mark lamar had a list of people he didn't want on the buzzcock and then when he left one of those people got on the show immediately <laughs> so yeah um oh yes i'd like to say um rest in peace sean hughes who died uh seven days ago today six days ago today um i'm going to his funeral tomorrow and I was very lucky to have a coffee with him f four weeks before he died. We haven't been out for coffee before. We've done, you know, TV and radio and podcasts together. But this time I bumped into him in the street and we said, hey, let's have a coffee. And we did. And I feel very lucky that I had that because otherwise I wouldn't have seen him. If I hadn't bumped into him, I wouldn't have seen him for a year or two years maybe. And it's just something lovely about being able to... In fact, I went to the same cafe and sat down, same place, on my own just to remember the time of him very very funny and charming and man and his memory was incredible for for things i'd said in the past and for lines in films and scenes in films yeah quite an incredible man so quite lost the comedy but the question yes I, if someone's thinking oh god listen to you yeah you know there's an art to being humble and sometimes people who aren't humble have mastered it because they know how to never sound arrogant ever you know the amount of comedians that the public adore those fans would be horrified if they heard how they're capable of talking when they're talking to their manager about their career or they're talking to their best friend down a pub about what you know what they've achieved you know there's so I, i'm probably so honest i can occasionally forget to be to fake humility but you know you've probably never heard of me listening who is this but i'm going to google him i'm going to email him for his website and tell him how arrogant he is but hopefully maybe i'm not arrogant and maybe the fact i'm even aware of that isn't arrogant in itself because true arrogance would be not not to even be self-aware enough to think that but now i've gone two stages away and now i'm being arrogant by acknowledging that i'm not arrogant so we're stuck in a loop now i i, I suppose they weren't they, they were they were some of them were a bit too personal so they were they were lacking in the chance for me to be very uh in depth in my answers because questions about your divorce or seeing your children are not things you're going to want to answer in too much detail because they're very personal so maybe i lacked the ability to hold back a bit so yeah too too much is in a way so in a way i lacked the ability to hold back because ironically asking such deep questions ended up with such brief answers um is that irony but there was definitely uh yeah you know, it's hard to ask 20 questions isn't it to yourself and the weird thing about asking yourself questions is you know the answers so saying to you i know you don't know the answer a year in a year year's time but you do know how you feel about stuff so going what would i think of the year's time is actually a very difficult thing to ask what if i died in that year god here's the here's the one for next year if you're dead how are you managing to hear this and answer it if you look back over the last year what was the memory that made you most happy that's a good question standing at the front door with my ex and saying something that made her laugh and her laughing and me laughing too because we both it wasn't so much a witty comment it was a realization of something that was said and humor within that sentence there was a pause and we both laughed together and it was a bit of having you know victor borger said laughter is the closest distance between two people to laugh with my ex and being that moment of sharing joy together no one else there that was my favorite memory of the last year <laughs> That was Adam. I loved how honest he was with his personal struggles, his life changes, his divorce, and his new dynamic and relationship with his kids, and starting over in a lot of areas of his life. I think it was good for me personally to hear him talk about pausing and appreciating how far you've come, rather than constantly wanting the next big thing. And I can't thank him enough for kicking off this series in such a personal and honest and humbling way. 
Here comes a little bit of admin, just so that you know. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do hit the subscribe button. There's going to be a new episode every two weeks. It's going to be the second and fourth Friday of the month. The reason this episode has come out today, i.e. the 5th of November 2017, is because on this date in 1955, Doc Brown invented time travel. So it felt like the right day to put it out, even though it isn't the second or fourth Friday of November. If you want to give the podcast a rating on iTunes, please do. It massively help out, and it would be amazing to just get some positive reviews early to kickstart this project. So if you do have time and you are able to do that please do if you have a friend who you think would enjoy this podcast please tell them about it as i said at the top it's taken me two years of work to get the format and the structure of this show right and then a year to create every single episode so any and all promotion would help beyond measure i i really really need your support if you are willing to offer it if you'd like to join the community for the show we have a facebook group it's called the audio time capsule podcast and it's on facebook obviously we're going to be posting exclusive content on there and sneak peeks behind the scenes to discussions around questions that guests have left so please do join if you can also if you're not on facebook or you just want to join somewhere else as well we'll have a twitter account where there'll be a bunch of time travel jokes and it's a great way to stay in touch with me and the guests and looking at who's going to be coming on you can find that at audio time travel or you can follow me my twitter handle is at this made me cool all of these links are in the show notes so just have a little browse in there if you had a pound spare and you want to donate to keep the show going please do a lot of work has gone into the show to get into this point and the production has been immense and quite a long-term strategy in order to get every episode done so if you could offer the money it would really help me out in fact to be honest with you you'd be paying towards season two because i've started recording the questions for the guests for that series now because obviously that'll be out in a year so these ones are out now it's all complicated honestly i've got a spreadsheet it's i do love my spreadsheet look i if you can help please do Uh, if you want to give a one-off donation you can do it on paypal on my website which is simonkane.co.uk or you can become a Patreon, which will mean that you can donate any amount you want from a dollar upwards every time there's a new episode. There'll be two episodes per month, so set your level at however much you think you can support the show at. I'm grateful for all amounts, so do not think that your donation is too big or too small. The Audio Time Capsule is a fruit that got in Gravity's Way production for the internet. All elements were created by me, comedian Simon Kane, except for the music that was composed by David Jordan. You can find links to everything I have discussed in this in the show notes. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for supporting. And thank you very much for donating if you do. I'll see you all in two weeks' time. Bye.